которого любила, про это очень писно берегла. As a player, and now the sixth president, Steel Borgia understands that barbarian rules are sacrosanct, and they've been jealously protected by the club's past presidents. Described as a Moses and Aaron, Emil de Lisa was something more besides. Jack Haig Smith died after only a few weeks in office. Glyn Hughes, distinguished physician and highly decorated soldier in two world wars. Herbert Waddle of Scotland, proud and forthright, how much of an honour was it when you were elected to be uh, the president of the Barbarians? Oh, I think it's a supreme honour. I was very fortunate in that I joined the committee in '46 uh, when I was at Cambridge, and I've been on it ever since. And so you've seen the passing of time and appreciated the tremendous amount of good that all these previous presidents did. How appropriate it was that the Barbarians were invited to play the 1948 Wallabies to raise enough money to send the Australians home via Canada. The Australians are unable to lay the Cardiff bogey. From ex-printer Cyril Holmes, number 11, comes the home side's first try, Edinburgh's steel bodger touching down. I think I had to push Douglas Elliott out of the way to score it, because I think he was really there first, but he was too big to bend down. I think that's the truth, really. But it was a remarkable thing. If I'm right, I don't think that the Wallabies had their line crossed in any international. They lost by penalty goals, and we scored three tries, and that was really the epitome of barbarian play. A third try comes from a Turner pass to Hayden Tanner, and the Australians go down by nine to six. And Norton was first for the club. It's now a tradition. Nick Shahedi of Australia played against the Barbarians in 1948. Ten years later, the role was reversed. He was chosen to play for the Barbarians against his fellow countrymen. I took an extra pair of boots along with me, with an extra size, and I ensured that I got dressed next to the captain of Cliff Morgan and. Uh, playing in Wales and we heard all sorts of rumours about Wales and I put these spare boots next to Cliff and he said, what is that for? And I said, for the boot money we hear about. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, <laughs> and I can assure you that uh, nobody came forward. <laughs> the Australian Barmeria made something of his life. From nothing, he created a flourishing family business. As in his rugby, it was sleeves rolled up and the hard slog of a good prop forward. I came from uh, a migrant background to Australia, a son of a clergyman who was never involved in sport. Um, we lived in an area that was then called underprivileged, um, and playing rugby opened many doors for me into, and uh, opened many horizons that otherwise I would never have been able to achieve without the rugby. The right honourable the Lord Mayor of Sydney. Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to have our safe thy blessing upon this council. Mr. O'Reilly, there's a telephone call for you, sir. Telephone call, Mr. O'Reilly. Olive. Another high-flying barbarian, A.J. F. O'Reilly of Ireland and the world, the business world, the youngest president of H.J. Hines, and now the chairman, deepening his imprint on corporate America. In Ireland, at his home of 300 acres in the lush and green county of Kildare, he breeds racehorses and prize cattle, runs three newspapers, and seldom sleeps. Uh, he sold 20% of it recently for 35 million. But he has time for charities and for old rugby friends. In 1959 in New Zealand, they doubted that this youngster would be hard enough to match the All Blacks. They were proved to be wrong. Now the crowd sees some of the play that's made O'Reilly's reputation. Adrian Clark can't stop him, but O'Reilly has to kick. The Lions are going to cross that goal line come what may. O'Reilly has the ball. He's streaking away. He throws a one-hander to Scotland. They'll never stop now. Jackson has it. He beats McPhail. He beats Urban. Colton won't stop him, and he's scored in the corner. A magnificent try that brings the score to three all, and the time is running out in the first half. How did you impose yourself? on a game. I tended to be rather neutral. Uh, there's a painting outside uh, uh, 
by an English painter, Norman Dickinson. He has me painted in the corner of the frame. I said to him, well, why am I in the corner of the frame? He said, well, I, he said, I was watching you for the last three weeks, he said, when I was doing this painting, he said, there's something essentially furtive about your nature, he said. He said, you sort of hang back when you walk into a room. And I suddenly realized that in a way that was a motif for my, my football. I hung back waiting for the game to show itself to me rather than allowing myself to show myself to the game. So I suppose in a way I was a slightly furtive rugby player. The Barbarian's first overseas tour was to Canada. Freedom to run and adventure made this the happiest of tours. O'Reilly celebrated his 21st birthday. I think it was the first time in the history of rugby where the team were actually in charge of the officials. Uh, and we had the most unusual time because it was essentially a missionary game. We went to bring the game. Uh, to Canada, and who better to bring the game of rugby football anywhere in the world as missionaries than the barbarians. From Toronto and Montreal, across the prairie provinces to British Columbia, great players from England, Scotland, Ireland and Wales displayed what's best about the game. A team tops in rugby and in the sing-song. Our Pavarotti loved Canada so much, he didn't come home. That was the mighty Irish forward Tom Reed. Yes, Tom uh, Reed was memorable for a number of his observations. He said, to, "All right," he said, "I love, I love, I love touring." He said, "It's the only time in my life I've ever had a second pair of trousers." <laughs> <laughs> we were issued with two pairs of flannels. He said, "The, bri the brigadier," he said, "he's a remarkable man, a remarkable man, the first man into Belsity." He said, "After the war, he said, a great patriot." He said, "You know, under stress," he says, "he's so patriotic, the veins in his face rearrange themselves into Union Jacks." <laughs> I think the fact that when you put on a barbarian jersey, you seem to absorb something, and uh, you realise that you've got to play up to our ideals. I think uh, that really expresses it. It was the Brigadier and Herbert Wardle of Scotland who managed the Barbarian Tour to South Africa in 1958. The final game against the Transvaal was at Ellis Park, Johannesburg. It ended in draw, but it could have been a Barbarian victory had not a photographer tripped up Tony O'Reilly in the in-goal area. What would have been a simple kick at goal to win the match was denied, but no one complained, for that's not the Barbarian way. The referee is always right. 34 points were scored in that drawn match, 30 of them from tries, three of them scored by Scotland's remarkable winger Arthur Smith, the star of that tour. The born hard grounds of the high felt proved ideal for the running game, and I suppose this old newsreel does make movements look a little faster than they actually were. The Barbarians went through that tour without winning, but it was a privilege to play my last game in a Barbarian jersey. The 1960-61 Springboks ended their tour playing the Barbarians at Cardiff, a match remembered for a famous win for the Barbars and one crunching tackle. And this time it's taken in there by Milan, the captain who goes striding on the touchline and he's hit into touch by Mainwaring, hammered into touch. Our manager was the Brigadier, or the Brigadier, as Tom called him, Brigadier H.L.G. Glyn Hughes. And Huey went into the South African dressing room ten minutes before the off and said, Look here, chaps, this tour has been rather grim, and I think you owe it to yourselves, to your talents, and to the British sporting public to throw the ball around today, give it a bit of air, a little bit of champagne football, the best barbarian tradition. So Evelyn Malan said, what are you saying? He said, it's absolutely, he said, it's raining cats and dogs out there. He said, there's no way we're going to throw them. Please, he said, the barbarian style. He said, you know, the public expects it. So very dubious, uh, very dubious about this. All right, he said, we'll, 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 we'll open up, he said, early on. Here we come straight back into our dressing room. He said, look out, chaps. He said, I think I bullshitted them into uh, throwing the ball around early on. I think there'll be a lot of loose ball around. You ought to score quickly and then tighten the game up and close it down. Which is exactly what we did, and we won. <laughs> and there's 
It's in trouble and Morgan's picking up and he scores! Lovely try! Fourteen, John Young to put it in. Drawing a long one. Tapped back by Culliton. Here comes the screen box now. Hayden Morgan, number seven. Gracious in defeat, Avril Milan was a much admired captain, an honorary barbarian. Little did he realize then that the next South African team to Britain, captained by David de Villiers, would have a troubled time. Anti-apartheid demonstrations obviously affected their play, but not in this game. De Villiers, lawless. Here's no miss on the overlap. Inside Jeffrey, knocked over by Melvin Davis. This is Jennings, de Villiers. This is great stuff, de Villiers, and a wonderful try for Ellis. The last Springbok team to play in Britain. This is Ellis from Jennings, over the 25. He's got de Klerk inside him, but what a wonderful score by Jean Ellis. Much of the world's rugby business is centred on the East India Sports Club in London, where Mickey Steele Bodger is the chairman. The Barbarian Club has no official meetings. Team selection, for instance, is conducted on the telephone. Hello, Celia. Jeff on the phone. Can I speak to Mickey, please? Hello? Afternoon, Mickey. Jeff on the phone. Yes, Jeff. Wouldn't mind finalising this side to play against England, uh -huh. if we can. Yes, indeed. We've got about 12, 13 now. We've got the French confirmed. Yes. Fortunately, Far Jones and Liner are happy, which is nice. And it's a, it's a question of the back row, really. Have you got any further views? No, I think Eric Rush would actually be superb. You remember both sevens we've seen him play really superbly well. Lose a bit in the lineup, but what pace? I mean, he'll be first Agreed. to the ball, and that'll be exactly what we want in that particular match. Agreed. That'll be four New Zealanders, and that's just about what we want. Agreed. Tremendous. Twickenham, September the 29th, 1990. The perfect and appropriate setting for the centenary match, England against the Barbarians. It's a royal occasion in every way. Traditionally, the Barbars invite one uncapped player to appear in their team when facing international competition. Honoured in centenary year is a 25-year-old New Zealander from Auckland, Eric Rush. Well, I was very excited. It was a bolt out of the blue for me. I understood from the start I was the only non-capped player. And uh, it was quite a privilege to be picked, uh, knowing all the people that have gone before me. So it was a very great honour. And it's, it's, it's the stuff dreams are made of. <laughs> That's a bit loose. Remember the ball slippery. Great work by Laporte to Chave. Slips it to Kenny Murphy to Campisi. Campisi against Tony Underwood, but Campisi's in. <laughs> Gary Reese held by Phil Davis, but it flicks back kindly to Hill. Andrew Carling, Gusket there. Outside long is Rory Underwood. Ducks inside Campisi. Floats it out to Hodgkinson. What a try. They'll run, I'm sure. Far Jones. Too low. There's Rush. Rush with the dummy hold. Now Neil back, his support outside. Joe Stanley, wide out is Campisi. Campisi floats it over the head. Back inside, Far Jones for the corner. And Phil Davis rounds it off. That's what they deserve, because that was in the best of barbarian traditions. That was one to save up. As the crowd stand to a man in celebration, Mickey Steelbodger, the president, the sixth only in the history of this club, will savour that moment. The uncapped player, Eric Rush, was the man of the match at Twickenham. 
As an outstanding seven-a-side man, he takes easily to the flowing, attacking barbarian style. Against Wales at Cardiff, he never stopped running. This, this match actually went home live, so probably half of New Zealand was awake at 3 o'clock in the morning to watch it, so that's how like, highly they regard the Barbarians rugby. They love it, running rugby. A Barbarian club flourishes in New Zealand, where the players have bought a little house alongside Eden Park. It's now their clubhouse, furnished with rugby memorabilia from all parts of the world. It's a perfect meeting place for telling tales and breathing fire. Wilson Winneray, finest of captains, led the fifth All Blacks to Britain. That long and successful tour ended with the Barbarian match at Cardiff. It was Winneray's great day. I'd had a good tour personally, and I was playing well, but I hadn't scored a point. I'd, I'd like to think I helped with some that were scored. <laughs> Their welcome in the hillsides in Wales for this New Zealand side if they play rugby like this. Paul Little, magnificent dummy, went away. Oh, I hope he scores it himself. Yes, he has. Oh, marvellous. The perfect climax. Well, it was rather lovely because the, the, the players, uh, uh, I think, were genuinely pleased that I'd at last scored a try that was a useful looking try. It, it had no impact on the game at all. And I think they were genuine in their support for me at that stage. And the crowd was singing, of course, and singing. And, and it was just a, a very magical moment. Mm. And if Wilson Winneray, this great New Zealand skipper, bows out in the big time on this note, what happy memories he will have, and us of him. It was a marvellous day and it's remained one of my abiding memories uh, that, will, uh, that I'll have until I leave this earth. But it was the emotions afterwards and, and film I've seen of getting myself off the field and this policeman helping me off and uh, crowds everywhere and young boys with their eyes all alive and alight. It was, it was magic. An All Blacks challenge has always set the pulse racing. At Twickenham, the Barbarians gave Brian Lahore's unbeaten team a fright. Two minutes of the match to go. New Zealand's unbeaten record almost gone, not quite. There's the ball they want to win, but the loiterers were in the way. The one or two Barbarians loiterers in the way. Laidlaw again, out to Curtin. Davis, this is a great chance for Tony Steele. It must be a try if he passes. Oh, and he had the spare man, but it is a try for McRae. A brilliant try for Ian McRae. So one conversion to win the match. And back we'll come to Fergie McCormick. And of all the kicks that McCormick has landed during this tour, and he's put over a vast number, I'm sure he would want to land this one more than any. It could be, no, it's just past the right-hand post. It's still six points all. I make it almost two minutes, close on two minutes of injury time played. A good heel against the head by McLeod. This is Laidlaw. Kick much too far. Wilson on his own 25. Doesn't find that. Brian Lafour, he's got the man outside him. There he is, it's Curtin. Tony still is going to score. It's a wonderful try, and the New Zealanders have saved their unbeaten record. Is there a, a specific moment, Tony, that you'd say um, that movement of a, a player expresses for me the real essence of rugby? I suppose before the war, 1936, that was the famous Obolensky try, the diagonal, the 
unusual try he scored. And its post-war equivalent was probably David Duckham's movements, his grace, his elegant haughtiness, and that astonishing sidestep that he had, which with his blonde hair streaming behind him made him look like a figure almost from another planet. Uh, I think he encapsulated for me uh, all of the elegance and grace and spontaneity of the game of rugby football as played and pursued by the Barbarians. Gareth Edwards using the narrow side, out to Duckham. My goodness, can't he move? Duckham inside H.O. de Villiers, this could be one of the tries of the season. And in that try in 1973, that famous oft-recorded try for the Barbarians against the grim-faced Stakhanovites from New Zealand, uh, you, saw, you saw rugby in all its technical excellence and all its simple, unashamed, spontaneous brilliance that is so essentially Barbarian. This is great stuff. Phil Bennett covering. Chased by Alistair Scott. Brilliant. Oh, that's brilliant. John Williams. Brian Williams. Pulling. John Dawes. Great dummy. It's David. Tom David. The halfway line. Brilliant by Quinnell. This is Gareth Edwards. A dramatic start. First goal. <laughs> Bill Bennett, who started it all, is now a sports development officer at Trinetli. Mr. John Williams, an orthopedic surgeon at the Princess of Wales Hospital in Bridgend. England and Lions hooker John Pullen still works on his farm near the Severn Bridge. The Barbarian captain John Dawes, deeply involved in rugby coaching. Tom David is joint managing director of an industrial solvents company. Derek Quinnell, managing director of the largest water treatment company in South Wales. Gareth Edwards, now deputy chairman of land and leisure for Welsh Water. These the magnificent seven. So coming to the great day, Cameron James had said to us, look, go out, relax, play a normal game. I thought, great, for 60 odd thousand, they play a normal game. And Brian Williams got the ball and he hoofed it towards the line. And I thought, oh, well, if I was playing for Wales here, the first thing would be in row E in the stand, you know. Phil Bennett covering. First thought in my mind was, oh, they're going to come like mad here. He got the ball, and before I looked down, Scown was on me like a flash. So I beat him on my right foot. Another little sidestep again, beat somebody. And I think I beat Kirky as well. But then, of all things, I threw a hospital pass to Dr. Williams, they were full back JPR, and he took Brian Williams down his neck. Well, a bit iffy, wasn't it? <laughs> uh, uh, of course, nowadays uh, it could well have been uh, even a sending off offence for a high tackle, but but luckily uh, um, I was able to ride uh, the high tackle from from Brian Williams. I don't think it was a, a, an intentionally nasty tackle. It was, a, it was a reflex thing, really. Once Benny beat three men and moved the ball, then I had no option but to continue it. Yeah, so we said the only thing wrong with that try was, was that there was an Englishman in it, <laughs> and that was me. Yeah. And JPR asked me to do that. If he'd seen it with me, I'm sure he wouldn't have. And all I remember was um, running with the ball. Some people said I sold a couple of dummies, but really I was just waiting for someone who turned out to be John Dawes to come up and take it off me. John Dawes! Well, I'm not really sure how much is real life and how much is, is television, because I see this so often on TV. But what impressed me about it was that uh, we had an attitude to play that type of rugby from the outset. John Dawes! Great dummy! It was a dummy without moving the ball. <laughs> it, it was certainly that they read my intention was to put, uh, to put John away, and uh, they bought that. And then, of course, uh, when I was clear, uh, there was support on the inside, and we continued in that vein. My first thought, Cliff, I had to get in support as a wing forward. Fortunately, John Dawes and a, a nice little bit of magic 
pass inside. I thought if I drop this, I'm in trouble. My first touch of my ball. At the end of the day, I mean, that's the style of play. I've always let the ball go as much as I can. When you're running at that pace, I think one of the things that forwards always find difficult is to run and think at the same time. So I'm not quite sure what is actually going through my mind. Yeah. But I'll always be grateful to Tommy, of course, because, um, you know, the pass was, wasn't a great one and it, it made me famous, I think. We get down with the boot laces there somewhere. That is nipped in there and you're screaming for the ball. I had to give it because I was stumbling anyway. Joe Caram would have been assessing the situation. He would have probably had one eye on Derek Quinnell and one eye on John Bevan on the wing. When I was coming through at pace, you see, and of course, when I took the ball, I shouted to Derek, whether he heard me or not, I don't know. Pull him up, throw it here, I said. And took it really at at maximum speed. And that was enough to take me around Joe Caram. And I must, I must be honest, after suffering so much with hamstring trouble for years, the only concern I had then was, please God, don't let them go now, because I knew I only had to make the line. And uh, it seemed like an eternity, Cliff. But I'd always remembered one thing that Bill Samwell used to say to me, when you go for a try, dive in because it's always more difficult for people to tackle you when you dive. And I must have dived from about 15 yards out, at least it felt like that. But, of course, the truth of the matter, it was far enough. This is Gareth Edwards, a dramatic start! The worst goal! If the greatest writer of the written word would have written that story, no one would have believed it. So the Barbarian Football Club has scattered its stardust for a hundred years. It's the sort of stuff that dreams are made of. The very style creates space to breathe, and the players are not inhibited by anxiety. But could this all change? Well, there is a conflict between the time that the players now have to devote to leagues, to international matches, squad sessions, training, tours, and the freedom to choose where and when you play. Now, in this world of often maddening complexity, the barbarian spirit needs to survive. It must flourish, because, you see, it provides that, that delicious difference, that delicate balance between the dogged and the carefree. I can safely say, without contradiction, it does work. And the toast is the barbarian football club. I must say that I will always wear my Barbarians tie with very great pride and I hope a lot of people go on to do so for many more years to come. I have no doubt at all that we can face this next hundred years, certainly the first part of it, with slightly amendments here and there, but we have to adapt to modern times. But we will still keep, I'm sure, the tradition of fun and friendship and playing as best you can with strangers and making them into one team. Barbarians repossessing and Galleon, Davis once more, Mullen. Ackerman, Underwood, Underwood flying for the corner, Gould set him up, but he's missed him, Underwood in, the Dutch judge hasn't ruled it out, the try is given. I think that uh, those that laid the foundations to the Barbarians had the foresight to say this is a game and it's all about people and rugby's about people. Uh, it's a great leveller. 
be a superstar. Buddy Basanga, they scored a few tries like this. He's up to the 25. This must be a score. He's a beautiful score. Screw up, Buddy Basanga. What drama. Oh, the crowd love that. Look at this big man going. Nausan Balabu. Nausan Balabu. From the second row forward. The flick out. What a winning for another try. Look at this for running. Oh, it's glorious stuff. They're playing. They're toying. It was a thrill to be allowed to play your natural instinctive game and not be told off if you made a mistake. And I think that was very nice, you know. We played, we played hard, we played to win. But uh, the winning wasn't the be all and end all, it was the way you play the game. And I think that's, uh, I think that's important. Um, certainly a real joy to play for them. David Duckham, Lambert misses him, Kirkpatrick as well. Colling was in that again. Derek Quinnell, Dawes, Williams, Gibson. Gibson, Slattery to John Williams. Barbarian rugby is all about a feeling, I think, or a spirit, or an essence, or a soul to the game. And rugby will go stronger, the game, the test matches, the World Cup, enormous events, bigger, more of them. But if it leaves behind its soul and its spirit, which talks of sportsmanship and behaviour and understanding the game and, and being at one with the players you play against within the great family of the game. If it ever leaves that behind, we'd be desolated, I think. And that's why all of us who are fond of rugby and fond of the barbarian spirit must ensure that it does not fade from the scene because it's just too important. Beautifully along the line to visit. Gus got great chance for you. Smoking Joe Stanley is away. Out there to Lafon. Lafon trying to cut inside. Edmunds put him on the wrong foot. Lafon in time to Stanley. Another gorgeous try. The drawing power of the Barbarians is nowhere stronger than at Leicester, where this annual fixture is a sellout months in advance. Seventeen and a half thousand people turned up at Welford Road, and the players duly entered into the spirit of things. We join the game early in the first half, Leicester leading 3-0. Your commentator is Nigel Starmer-Smith. Dangerously loose, Barbarians advantage. Beautifully floated past by Hill. Lafon in the line, surely a try. Neat little dummy, coasts in. Jean-Baptiste Lafon and a touch of class in the whole of that movement. Now watch here as the partnership working so sweetly. That's perfectly placed for Rob Andrew to set up then this uh, delightful sequence of passes. And Lafon, the flying Frenchman, Oh, the, the best of dummies. So, quickly back and in the lead with the first try of the day. Left-footed uh, place kicker then, Lafond from the Racing Club. No problem. Quarter of an hour played. So that's 6-3 to the Barbarians. Hill again. Andrew, this is out, Gusket straight to Maynell, Lafond in the line, the rushing pair in the sweet movement, that looked forward, they've got away with it, Moon inside to Robinson, 10 metres out, ball loose, and knocked forward. It's useful to have a, a club pair, full back and centre, outside centre, and they can time things like that. Familiarity with each other, important. Cardoni, Lyle again, very deep and in trouble, eludes the marauding back row men, but it's not in touch. Lafond, Guscott, <laughs> carving his way through the middle all the way. Yes! Oh, 
Great solo effort, Jerry Guskin. Well, out of nothing really, but the show of the ball and then that deceptive acceleration. So Rob Andrew from the 22. Fine kick. 12-3, two tries to nil. And Barbarians looking in the inspired form. Five is Arnold, four. Chris Gray, six, Poole Jones. Hill, Andrew, Minnell. So uh, again, the midfield solid. In Leicester's defence. In front of the pass. Hill, Moon rather on his own. But he's made something of it. My word, he's still going. He's clean through. What a remarkable score by the replacement. They stood and watched him. Well, well, well. Again, a real something out of nothing. And where was the tackling? From this position, he had four men in front of him and took the diagonal run. It was the angle that made it and just kept going. Everyone quite sure where the ball was. Leicester have recovered well. Harris, Bates, Tony Underwood in the line. He's got Lyle outside if he needs him. Lyle now trying to get the return pass to Tony Underwood. No, already the flag is up. The Barbarians think a try has been awarded, but I think you'll find that if Ian Bullerwell's attention can be attracted. He had Lyle there outside. Well, the touch judge, Dusty Hare, standing there bravely, and finally, of course, the referee has taken notice. Harris, double miss move, and a lovely switch to Lyle. Oh, what a pickup! That was brilliant by Bates. Underwood, Rory Underwood is in. Brilliant improvisation, and what handling for once. Now, that's a perfect start to Leicester in the second half. Well, a moment to savour here. Lyle on the double miss move coming in. That was one of the great pickups. Bates then acting as the link. And again, not the greatest pass, but well uh, gathered by Rory Underwood. Rounds Lafourne and in characteristic fashion gets it down with the right hand as the body goes over the corner flag. 16-10. Well, well. And I saw Dusty Hare raise his flag behind the goal the moment that that ball left the ground. What a kick from Lyle. And 16-12 puts it all in the melting pot, as they say. Going for the second heave, and it's well controlled. Grant still has it there at his feet. The Barbarians are conceding ground. Can they stop it going the 90 degrees? It's up to Cardooney. Jess Harris on the switch. Tony Underwood's clean through. And just left the Barbarian defence standing. So it was a fine scrummage effort. And sensibly, as the scrummage began to wheel, they flicked it out, and here was where Tony Underwood didn't look on, but he just saw the gap and rocketed through it. So the score's level, the conversion attempt is successful by Lyle, and Leicester lead 18-16. Tap back by White, Phil did well, Andrew, Maynell, Guskett, again, uh, man and ball, Heslop gathers. And is away. Still going. Back comes Rory Underwood. Heslop has support from White. Lafond inside. Cool Jones. Cool Jones to the corner. Good try. To recapture the lead for the Barbarians. White initially. 
then back inside from La Fonde and the strapping 22 year old student Richard Poole Jones to round it off to worker from La Fonde to recapture the lead and a four point margin quarter of an hour into the second half 22 to 18 and the tradition of high scoring maintained crowd trying to rouse the Tigers again but it's Hill swiftly away Guscott now with close attentions Robinson in support on the 22 Hill lightning passes from him this is Lafond Moon into the corner yes delight for the player who only came on as replacement for the luckless Arthur Emir his second try and one that could be absolutely vital to the outcome Lafond got through the tackle sufficiently well there's still a bit to do here and he did it a festive tradition which if anything seems to get better with the years we'll be back next week and next year but for the moment from the rugby special team a very good new year to you all